Okay, um, so hello everybody. Um, my name is Caroline dodds -Penick. I'm a lecturer in the Department of History. Um, and I'm going to try and talk to you this afternoon today a little bit about a project I'm working on about indigenous Americans traveling to Europe. Um, a few years ago, as an Aztec historian working in Europe, I began to wonder why we hear so much about Europeans going to the Americas after 1492 when Columbus discovers the New World and so on and so forth, and so little about Americans traveling the other way. And so I started looking into it, and it turns out that there were really a lot of them. Pocahontas, or, at, oh dear, sorry, um, I should have gone forward. Pocahontas, or at least her romanticized Disney alter ego, is only the most famous of this, uh, what I might choose to call a substantial indigenous American diaspora almost. My own particular interest though is in Aztec travelers from central Mexico. And so today I just want to try and give you a taste of some of the very earliest Aztec travelers to Europe and also perhaps just a very brief idea about why they might matter in historical terms, why we might find them interesting. The very first Aztecs to set foot in Europe arrived in 1519 along with the huge treasure sent to Charles V of Spain by Hernando Cortes, the conquistador who was busy conquering Mexico at the time. Along with six so-called ambassadors, there was also a rather young Mexican who was brought to court as a slave, so the records say, by Juan de Rivera, Cortes's envoy. This native slave appeared at court with a compatriot in indigenous battle array and gave a demonstration of Aztec practices of human sacrifice and captive taking to a rather horrified audience of observers that were absolutely fascinated by it. Um, according to the chronicler Peter Martyr, after dragging his unfortunate colleague around by his hair, the Aztec threw him to the ground and, according to the source, he feigned to cut open his breast above the heart with a knife. After tearing out the heart, he wrung from his hands the blood flowing from the wound and then besprinkled the sword and shield. I should just be clear at this point, he's pretending to do these things, he's not actually doing them at the Spanish court, but the audience was absolutely fascinated by the whole thing anyway. A few years later, we see a rather different sort of Aztec visitor to Europe, someone the Spaniards see as rather more respectable individuals when two young nobles, known only to us as Don Rodrigo and Don Martin, though those probably weren't their original names, appear at court as ambassadors of their noble families. They have an audience with Charles V, and he sends them off to study Christian doctrine at a monastery in Talavera before granting them land and royal privileges, and then they return home to Mexico. But probably the most famous Aztec visitors for, to Spain arrive in 1528 when Cortes returned from Mexico for the first time after his triumphant conquest. He brings with him a rather grand entourage intended to impress people with the wealth and glamour of his newly acquired realms. And in his train is a group of more than 30 Aztecs, um, which includes all different kinds of people. This colourful group includes two sons of the Emperor Moctezuma, who you may have heard of as Montezuma, entertainers, nobles, birds, animals, objects, even freaks as they're called. Among the group are jugglers who toss logs into the air with their feet like this chap here, um, tumblers, magicians, dwarves and hunchbacks, along with a large group of about a dozen Tlaxcalans. These are close neighbours and actually enemies of the Aztecs of Tenochtitlan before the conquest. And they played a traditional ball game for the amusement of the court, just like these chaps here. These pictures actually are drawn by a German man called Christoph Weiditz, who sees them at the court and is so impressed that he makes a record of their visit. So we have these wonderful pictures of them from life. Charles V is apparently so delighted with the musicians and the dancers that he sends them on to Rome to entertain Pope Clement VII. The party of Aztecs stayed in Spain for at least a year most spending some time in Seville, as well as traveling around the country. A man called Benito Matatlaqueni even visited Rome to see the Pope. As a cultural historian, I would really love to know what the reactions of these Aztecs were to their European adventure. But unfortunately, as far as I can tell, there aren't any sources that let us access directly how they thought or felt about all these things that they were seeing and doing. This is a real problem with my project, and actually with indigenous histories in this context generally. 
Um, the sources that we have are perhaps inevitably nearly always records written by Europeans who either met, saw or kidnapped the Aztec participants in question. And this is true of all Native American travellers really. The records do tell us that at least three of the Aztecs died in Seville. A handful sailed for New Spain on the Santa Maria in August 1529. Uh, some seem to have stayed at court and taken up posts and, and royal commissions and the others disappear from the historical record. Now I think that these sorts of indigenous travellers are really fascinating in their own right, obviously, um, but why does all this matter? Why should we care about these kinds of indigenous migrants? I suppose I would say that in some ways this is a project of recovery, of filling a gap in our knowledge, finding out about these interesting people that we haven't looked at before. But on a broader level, my research also suggests that closer study of the early American diaspora in Europe might also transform our understanding of the early modern world. To give you just one example, um, it might change, I think, the way we regard transcontinental and cross-cultural networks and diffusion routes. The, the way things spread, essentially. So, for example, the way that things like food, music, religious ideas and practices, goods, stuff, even tastes and preferences are moved between continents. When we recognise the fact that there are thousands of Native Americans in Europe from as early as the 1490s, it becomes really impossible to dismiss them as just insignificant oddities, which is how they've traditionally been treated by history, just as kind of curiosities. Now, we know that the Americas had a huge impact on Europe in material terms, uh, and vice versa. So literally hundreds of new plants, animals, and foods flooded across the Atlantic in both directions. So coming from the Americas to Europe, tobacco, chocolate, tomatoes, potatoes, corn, beans, peppers, I could go on and on and on. The trouble is that people seem to have forgotten where all this stuff came from. So nowadays, tomatoes are normally seen as Italian rather than Mexican, potatoes as Irish rather than Peruvian, spicy food made with chilies is associated with India, not with Mexico. And what's happened, I think, is that the failure of people to recognize the mobility of Native Americans, the fact that people, as well as stuff, moves around, has resulted in a sort of European monopoly on Atlantic exchange. Indigenous people have been cut out of our understandings of the way things moved around. So, uh, Walter Raleigh with his tobacco and potatoes is trumpeted as the discoverer of American products, in England at least. But indigenous Americans are smoking in Europe long, long before um, Raleigh discovers tobacco for Elizabeth I. I hope that my research will kind of help us to think in some new ways about the way our world develops. So many things, for example, that we take for granted as being British are actually of foreign origin. Before we encountered the Americas, for example, you couldn't have had a Christmas dinner with turkey and roast potatoes. Before 1492, there are no turkeys in Europe, no potatoes in Europe. Um, thousands of indigenous Americans traveled to Europe in the 16th century. And I think that only by recognizing the fact that they were there can we understand the ways in which our modern multicultural world developed. Plus, I think they're pretty fascinating in their own right, and so I hope you've enjoyed hearing a little bit about them. Thank you very much.